Good afternoon and welcome to the KBH Energy Center Distinguished Lecture Series. I am Nick Gibson, a second year MBA student here at McCombs. Before we get started, I would like to tell you a little bit about the KBH Energy Center. The KBH Center is a joint endeavor of the University of Texas School of Law and the McCombs School of Business and leverages the resources and talents of the two schools by collaborating with the many other schools, centers, and areas of study that compromise the unparalleled collection of energy-related talent, expertise, and knowledge at the University of Texas. If you are interested in learning more about the KBH Center, please visit the website, which is in the chat box. Now, I would like to introduce you to our speaker for tonight's event, Dr. Scott Tinker. Dr. Scott Tinker is director of the 250 person Bureau of Economic Geology, the State Geologist of Texas, and a professor holding the Edwin Alday Endowed Chair in the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Tinker is also founder and chairman of the nonprofit Switch Energy Alliance and recently completed two new films, Switch On, a feature length documentary addressing global energy poverty and Energy Makes Our World, a five minute Hollywood quality film made for global museums and giant screens. Dr. Tinker is the voice of Earth Day, a two minute weekly program that focuses on remarkable stories of Earth. Earth Date is produced by the Bureau of Economic Geology and is featured on over 400 NPR and public radio stations in all 50 United States. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Tinker. Nick, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Are we good? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. <laughs> I don't want to talk without without the sound. So it's good to be here with you today. And thank you all for attending at five o'clock here in Texas. Got a lot to cover and hopefully we'll have time for discussion as well. So we'll do this in three parts. Talk about global energy a little bit. Look at this thing called energy transition and transitions and then some of the impacts of energy. Start with global energy, real big picture, big issues facing the world today. I've listed several here. And many of these are related to the economy and particularly to poverty. I colored them orange. And of course, energy sits here and so does climate change. And many would paint climate or energy, but really it's climate and energy and, and land and air and water as well. Climate, land, air, and water are all part of our environment. So it's the environment and energy and the economy, the three E's. And we want energy to be three things. We want it to be cheap, we want it to be reliable, and we want it to be clean. Now this isn't easy. Let's just say this is aspirational because it's not, not very easy to do that uh, with large scale energy. We've got to strive to not only be completely factual, but also factually complete. And I'll try to highlight some of the differences in that here and why it's so important to do both. We're going to start with cheap. What is cheap? Well, it's volatile. How volatile is that price? And we know that oil can be volatile in its pricing. Look what happened in the Great Recession and COVid spiked below zero at one point in time there. But you know, so can other commodities. Copper for wind turbines is very volatile in its pricing. So is cobalt for batteries, it turns out. And, and most other things that are related to energy have volatile pricing. We also talk about affordability with cheap. The levelized cost of energy or levelized cost of electricity is used by many to compare costs. And it shows that in fact, solar and wind have come below coal. And that's exciting. Look at where they've come from and where they've gone. But this is the price at the gate. So it's completely factual. But is it factually complete? What is the cost of the intermittency of solar and wind? Because you have to have backup to be reliable. So you need a load following plant of some kind or the ability to store the electricity or some large area renewable dispersion or combining different sources of different kinds. And these might all make it more reliable and, and, and remove some of that intermittency, but that's expensive. So backup for reliability makes solar and wind more expensive to the consumer. When you look at a map of the US, this is the cost of electricity by state, you can see that. 
the reds and the yellows are two times more on the retail prices and even more to the consumer than those in the gray, for example. So that's kind of a factory complete story, the, the actual cost of backup. Reliability, intermittent. And this is, this is one of the most important things I'll show you. The old demand curve. This is a week in Texas in the summertime. And demand goes way up when we're running our air conditioners and down in the evening. And here's the wind. We have a lot of wind. It's not scaled the same, to be sure. But wind isn't always following our load or our demand. So when the wind is low and the demand is high, the price of energy spikes in Texas, in ERCOT. And we all know about ERCOT now. It's called an energy market. That's what it's actually designed to do. It wasn't designed to spike as high as it did. So balancing demand and supply requires a portfolio of generation options in order to be reliable. And we need it to be available. And this picture was taken right out my window right here back in February uh, during the big chill. And in February, I've shown the freezing line. And here's the temperature in Dallas for the highs. And here's the temperature in Dallas for the lows. So you can see when it went below freezing and stayed there. This is the energy mix coming into that, a fairly normal week, first week of February with nuclear level on and coal kind of variable a little bit, natural gas coming and going in green and following the wind load. And we use a lot less wind and sun in the wintertime because we're refurbishing those. We don't have, our demand isn't as high. We're not running electricity for air conditioners. Nonetheless, we use some and it was about half on certain days here. And then it started to get cold. And what you see happen is sun went away for the most part, the solar got, the panels got buried in snow and it was again, cloudy and low horizon sun and short days. The wind got cut tremendously as well. The, the turbines weren't performing well, they weren't winterized. And then coal stayed flat for a week and nuclear and natural gas just kept going up. It went up more than double over a seven day period and we met our extreme demand forecast peak on, on Valentine's Day, the highest we ever thought it would be in the winter, we met. That's phenomenal really in many ways. And then it stayed cold. A nuclear reactor went offline because it's cooling uh, fan broke or froze. Some coal piles froze up. We saw natural gas get cut and you can be completely factual when you say natural gas went down 30%. It did from an absolute high, double what it ever was expected to do. And of course, wind and solar completely went away at that point in time, and the blackouts began. So those are the data. We hit a 75 gigawatt February 16th peak demand. That's the data. So the timing and the scale, it all matters, but boy, there was an unlimited supply of one thing, and it still continues finger pointing. Natural gas is the culprit. Solar and wind tanked. It's an isolated grid. That's the problem. ERCOT and its planning was terrible. The energy market, we should be a capacity market. Resiliency of the equipment was bad. The cost upgrade, climate change caused it, you know, and it, the truth, it's some of all of these things for sure, but you really have to look carefully at the actual data to understand it. You have to ask the question, what's the cost and benefit of making that grid more reliable? What's the cost and benefit of putting air conditionings in Montana, for example, may have some really hot summer weeks, but what's the cost and benefit? And that's what we have to really do. And I hope that gets done in Texas. And finally, there's clean, cheap, reliable, and clean. CO2 emissions, of course, is a big part of that conversation. And young people, I know when this was taken, were skipping school, and that's okay, exercising their right to protest and be heard globally. Save Earth, save yourself. And I think to these young folks, and many in Western Europe and the US, ESG and environmental, social, and governance is climate. And that's okay. You know, climate change is a big issue. But so is local air. So Sanu Kanchi, who we featured in Switch On, I took this picture in Nepal. Climate isn't top of mind to her. Uh, cooking is, and cooking indoors with wood and biofuels and other things, and the health impacts of that. It turns out a third of the world still cook indoors with wood, dung, charcoal, and other biomass. And we featured this in our film, Switch On, 2.6 billion people. It kills 3 million a year. We go into a hospital and see some of that. That's more than COVID killed in 2020. That's more than malaria and AIDS combined every single year, dying from something that's very solvable. And then we talk about land and water, the other two big pillars of clean or of the environment. I took this picture outside Nairobi in a, in a slum called Kibra. And these kids are coming home from school in their uniform, stepping across ever-present mounds of garbage and polluted water and soils. 
and bad local air. So when you look at poverty and you ask yourself, how extensive is it? This is a map of global income. On the high end, the developed world, more than $12,000 a year now, doesn't sound very high, does it? $1,000 a month? Think about living on that. Poverty in the US is around $22,000 a year, almost double that poverty is, but this is the high end of global. Not many places, the blue US, Western Europe, Saudi and middle, parts of the Middle East, Japan and Australia. And we like it clean. We, we want our energy to be cleaner and we can afford to do the environmental things and, and regulatory things to do that. On the low end, the thousand dollars a year or one to 4,000 a year. So that's three bucks a day up to $10 a day income. That's pervasive in Africa and Southeast Asia, the yellows and some of the reds, and they need cheap energy. They're just getting started. And then in the developing world, four to 12,000 a year, Latin America, Central and South America, Eastern Europe and parts, they've got energy, but they need it more reliable. So our film switch on featured the countries in these circles and all the different kinds of energy poverty and energy access challenges, energy inequality. And we looked at schools. These young kids aren't, weren't skipping school. They wanted to be in school. They'd gotten two light bulbs hanging from the ceiling there. I took this picture for the first time and they could see inside their school at night. And here's a school in Ethiopia where they're now be able to see indoors as well. And a picture I took down in Colombia for the first time, we brought first solar and ceiling fans and lights and mud huts and thatch roofs. And again, they'd never seen each other inside at night except over a very low fire. Remarkable time for them. And I hope you get a chance to see the film. So what does it mean? What does little to no energy mean? Well, there's three kinds of people in the world. Those who are good at math and those who aren't. So which of the three are you? I'm gonna do some simple arithmetic here. This is the kilowatt hour consumption per person in a year in different countries in Africa. We featured Ethiopia and Kenya in our film you don't speak kilowatt hour, I'll just compare it to my fridge. My fridge consumes nine times more electricity in a year than Ethiop an average Ethiopian, three times more than an average Kenyan, a person, their total energy consumption, that's energy poverty. Now, when you think about this on a per capita basis, per year, per person, North America consumes a lot and Europe does too, not as much, lots of reasons for that. And then Asia, Africa and South and Central America much less per capita starting to grow. Then Russia and the Middle East, large again, more than Western Europe, more than Europe. So looking at Asia and Africa and South and Central America, we see that there are about 7.7 .7 billion people in the world today, the same color scheme here. And more than three quarters of the humans live in these three regions. And they consume less than one eighth of the global energy per person. So the growth is starting to happen and it is going to grow tremendously as five and a half billion or more people begin to get access to energy. So featuring those three regions, here's South and Central America. This is electrification rate on the left against poverty, income per day, three bucks a day, that's severe poverty. And you can see that Latin America is mostly electrified, 80, 90%. 10 to 20% severe poverty with Brazil being the largest country. Same scale, here's Asia, less electrified, more severe poverty. And then Africa, another 1.1 billion people, much less electrified and more severe poverty. And I'm highlighting Kenya and Ethiopia, some of the countries we featured. So you can see this relationship between poverty and electricity. It's not a causative, there's certainly a strong correlation. It presents a paradox, energy doesn't end poverty, you can't end poverty without energy. So energy underpins economies. I've shown you some data here. And economies allow you to do what? Invest in the environment. The cleanest environments in the world are where it's wealthy. I've been in 65 countries on six continents. Without exception, the dirtiest soils, water, air is where it's poor. Affordable, reliable, available energy <clears throat> poverty, competition, and growth, and air, atmosphere, land, and water, the pillars of the environment. It's complicated. Social, legal, political systems are very interactive. <clears throat> you can't underestimate the complexity here. And let's kind of put a little bit, I 
tend to avoid this, but I get asked so many times, you know, the political side of things. In a general sense, left-leaning focus more on clean, particularly in the developed world, and right-leaning focus more on reliable. Very generally, it's not that either of those doesn't think about the other. And certainly the emerging and developing are focused on cheap. So here again, we see our cheap, reliable, and clean. And coal and oil are the foundational energies of modern societies. Now we're transitioning away from them in the developed world, but the emerging and developing is just getting started and they're using coal and oil and they're gonna to continue to do that. China's announcements, if you have read, continue to say, hey, we're gonna use coal and India is doing the same. Contrary to <laughs> political spin, you look at the actions. Now, reliable natural gas and nuclear, uh, cleaner for sure in terms of emissions and other things as well. And on the clean side, wind and solar and batteries. And we try to bring all these together right into that center overlap space because they're all important for different reasons and different geographies. And it's hard to move energy. It's hard to move electrons for sure. It's done on power lines of various kinds and transoceanic is difficult. We move them as molecules on pipelines, trains, trucks, and boats and as products. But moving energy is expensive and it's difficult. So again, we wanna bring those together into that center spot. Uh, that, and there is where equitable lies. Equitable energy lies in that overlap space as you start to think globally about who needs cheap and reliable and clean. So equitable is access to affordable and reliable energy, which underpin a healthy economy and a clean environment because you can afford to invest in it. Energy, the economy, and the environment. Cheap, reliable, clean. Economy, energy, the environment. And that's really the waltz that goes on all over the world. And it's not binary. Okay, it's not clean and dirty, good and bad. It's complicated, but it's time to power the people. So let's talk about transitions. This is a complicated figure if you just look at it all at once, but let's build it together. We consume energy in four big ways, residential, commercial, industrial, and we move ourselves around. Heat and cool things move ourselves around. Coming into that is electricity. Electricity generation feeds all those sectors, not much in transportation yet, but potentially growing. And then oil, and all my slides from here on out are color-coded. Green is always oil. And it's mostly for transportation, some industrial and commercial and residential. And these are in order of size in the United States, okay? In order of amount of energy consumed and the width of the bar shows that. Natural gas is next and it's very versatile. Power generation, residential, commercial, industrial, we're even putting in cars as CNG and LNG in products. Coal is next, almost exclusively power, some steel and other things. Nuclear is next, it's all power generation. Then comes biomass. We still burn a lot of things in this country. Uh, biomass, wood and dung and coal and plants and things, carbon basically. And then hydro uh, is next, dams and then wind and then uh, solar and finally geothermal, which is just getting started again. So it's interesting when you look at it this way and out of the right end comes Energy services, let's call it useful work in a real energy term, work. But the number on the right is much less than the number on the left. In fact, two thirds of the energy that comes in gets wasted or rejected. It's inefficient, a huge opportunity to do more with the energy that we're bringing into the system. These are the thermal energies. We burn them to make heat and do work with it or uranium and thorium make heat. It's most of it. And these are the renewable energies. Not much yet, but getting started, certainly in the developed wealthy world. Another way to think about this is, is going back over a thousand years to cooking over a fire and staying warm. Uh, humans did that. And we used the sun to grow things like hay and the, and the vehicles ate the food and they dragged their own food around, oxen and horses. And the motion of water was used to turn wheels and mills and to turn windmills to pump water up. We killed whales to get their oil and light indoor buildings with whale oil. And then we use bigger wheels. We call them dams now. And then this engine pulled its own food around called coal. Uh, coal became quite prominent and we would burn coal to make steam and do a lot of things, including make electricity to turn on the lights. And then liquids came along, leaving the solid world. And we could put liquids into cars and planes and other vehicles and many other uses. And finally, natural gas, methane and then nuclear, uranium and thorium. 
So what is this really showing over this last thousand years? It's showing you a transition in some ways from low density energy to high density energy. And here they are. This is their power density, watts per meter squared. And you can see the things that are significantly denser than other things. It means you can do a lot more with a meter of land but with the things on the right than on the left. Now these are renewable and these are thermal. We've talked about that. That's kind of a non-judgmental term. And then we have terms that are more judgmental. These are clean and these are dirty. On the, on the flip side, well, these are intermittent and these are dispatchable, okay? You can see where I'm headed. It just depends on how, what terms you like to use. But one thing we do know is these are carbon-based fuels, biomass and coal, and oil is a hydrocarbon and methane is hydrogen for the most part. One carbon and four hydrogens into a hydrogen economy, then you get uranium and thorium. So this transition is towards higher density and lower carbon. And it's been happening naturally for a long time. Higher density, lower carbon. Now we had the sun and the wind in the past and we're bringing them back, just bigger. Okay, bigger engines, bigger machines, simple machines to collect the sun and the wind. So that means we're gonna to try to go to a lower density form and lower carbon. And that's not gonna be easy. There are significant challenges with that. It's doable, but it's not without challenges, physics and economics and other things. So when we talk about transitions, we talk about types. I have three, they're event driven ones from nature, hurricanes or tsunamis, uh, economic like COVID and we shut down the global economy, big advances in technology, they're pretty unpredictable. There's policy driven, public opinion can drive things and energy security or perception of, they're cyclic, depends on who's in power, doesn't it? And then there's the resource ones, power density, which we've just talked about and scale and access. And these tend to be more sustained. So let's look at some of them, real data. Here's Japan, nuclear energy, same color scheme. And then it went away with Fukushima Daiichi. What did they replace that nuclear with? Not much with coal or oil, but a lot with natural gas make electricity, dispatchable electricity, and have started to grow some solar and wind in the most recent years. So this is, this is an event-driven transition in Japan. Now in France, it's different. You know, we see oil and coal growing in the 60s, and every, all of a sudden they go way down and nuclear goes up. And everything else isn't much in France. This is policy. France said, we don't have much coal and oil or natural gas, we're gonna go nuclear. And as a result, their CO2 emissions look like this. They went up and they've been coming down steadily and they're getting pressure from Europe to shut down nuclear for some reason in a climate driven Western Europe, uh, European Union for some reason pressuring to shut down nuclear, which I find hard to understand. It's at zero emissions, very efficient and already built. Keep your nuclear, France. Here's Germany, German electricity, fascinating story. Coal was kind of coming down while gas went up. Nuclear was pretty steady and significant. And here was everything else with some solar and particularly wind growing. And this was CO2 emissions were coming down nicely. It's a resource transition. Emissions down as consumption went up because of the change in the energy mix. And there's your emissions trend for CO2. Then something happened. The 2009 Great Recession, which was just a dimple, consumption flattened for electricity. And emissions flatten too. What? They were going up with emissions down. Now consumption's flat and emissions are flat. How did that happen? Well, they got worried about fracking in 09 and Fukushima Daiichi in 11. And Germany decided through policy to reduce nuclear and natural gas. And you can see the red and the orange going way down. But when they did that, coal stopped going down. They had to have something for base load. And in the last couple of years, consumption has gone down. Good for Germany less consumption, more efficiency. And now the CO2 emissions right in here, which were coming down, went back, you know, flattened, and they're finally starting to get almost to where they were over a decade ago. So this wasn't good, well-intended policy. These guys had good intentions too. They were putting in posts, keep people from parking next to the building. They kind of forgot where they parked, okay? And, and policy can do this too. And you don't tend to remove those policy posts very easily for lots of reasons, as you know, with politics. So we gotta not look just at intentions, but outcomes. Here's Brazil. Brazil's oil has been growing and then hydro, tremendous resource, then everything else with the light green being the, the, the bio, 
okay? Look at the green and now we say, what, what have Brazil's emissions done? They've gone up, 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 and they've kind of flattened in the last six, seven years, but so has consumption. It's been tough economy down there. So most of that is driven by an economic challenge. Interestingly enough, you read a lot about biofuels in Brazil and it is the best in the world, but they satisfy only a little portion of energy consumption in Brazil, total energy. It's that little green wedge. Scale is so important. It matters tremendously and we, we forget about scale. Speaking of scale, here's China. There's China's coal and everything else in China. This isn't electricity, it's all energy. All the other energy in China doesn't equal its coal, okay? So this was, here's the emissions, no surprise, going up and then way up. Resources were driving and now policy. China has a coal policy and it hasn't changed that. Now, if I take China and lay, just put on top of it, Norway. Norway has a tremendous resource of hydro. Topography, rainfall, fjords, rinse and repeat. The blue is phenomenal, low emissions and very reliable electricity. But what's missing here when I lay those on top scale? Let's scale Norway the same as China. It essentially goes away. In fact, China produces more solar energy, it's a little teeny wedge than all of Norway's total energy consumption. And this is the great challenge again of global scale with energy. Now let's look at China and India. I'm gonna lay India on top of China, here it is. The energy mix looks very similar. The ramp up is similar in terms of growth rates. One thing that's missing here is scale. I'm going to scale India the same as China now. Here we go. It's a little less than a third of China in terms of energy consumption today, even though the mix is very similar. I need to slide India to the left for 25 years, and it essentially lays down on top of China. Same population today, it will pass China as China 25 years ago. And the energy mix is the same. Where India goes matters to the global atmosphere tremendously. If it follows the Chinese coal model, we have big challenges and they've just announced that they're planning to build a lot of coal, okay? How about electricity in the United States? We had coal, it was going up. Natural gas was going up, nuclear was going up. And other things too, our demand for electricity was going up, up, up to about 2007. <clears throat> our emissions had gone up and then they were kind of flat because we were changing the mix. <clears throat> Excuse me, coal had flattened but natural gas and nuclear and renewables were growing. And then again, something happened. You see the great reception, recession, it's barely a dimple in time, but look what happened. Consumption flattened and CO2 emissions started going down. Why? How did emissions go down in the US? Well, partly fracking. Fracking made natural gas really cheap and it's been replacing coal in a big way. You can see the red replacing the gray and then the state renewable portfolio standards as well, which is those upper three slices. So it's mostly a resource transition. And <clears throat> we have a lot of shale in the United States. These are the big shale gas basins. The large circle is the amount of gas in place in the Barnett. And the little one, the little pink one, is what's been produced so far from all the drilling, 20,500 vertical well bores. Here's the same scale for the Fayetteville and the Haynesville. And this is, by the way, 12 years of work from a team of 20 people at the Bureau, scientists, engineers, economists, the most rigorous studies of these shale basins in the world, okay? And here's the Marcellus. Look at the size of the circle, they're scaled the same. And look what's been produced from the Marcellus so far, that little pink circle with 27,000 wells. And we also have gas out in West Texas, both in the Midland and the Delaware Basin, a lot of natural gas, in fact, more than anywhere except the Marcellus. And as a result, the United States began, instead of importing LNG, began exporting it. You can see the effect of COVID, that dimple near the end here, but LNG exports are on the rise from the United States. This is technology. A lot of technology goes into play to produce from shale and move it. On the oil side in shales, the Bakken and the Eagle Ford, and then finally the Midland Basin and the Delaware Basin, both are part of the Permian Basin. These are big, big numbers. And that little green circle is what's been produced. So 5% of technically recoverable gas of technically and 8% of technically recoverable oil has been produced to date, much smaller percent of the actual in place. It leaves a lot of opportunity <clears throat> and the world is just getting started. Just read this morning that China's announced about 25 new shale wells. They've been trying for a long time. We'll see where that goes. 
And of course, the Middle East and Russia have a tremendous amount of shale resource. What did this do? What did this shale do? Production rose in the United States of oil and then came down, down, down. Our imports went up, up, up. We were exporting nothing. And then in about 08, 09, when we began to understand how to produce oil from shale, not just gas, look what happened. Production went way up, more than doubled. Imports went way down and we started exporting oil. And now Congress is talking about, or at least a group of five in the Senate, not allowing for the US to export oil. So politics can certainly play a role, policy here. Intended consequences and unintended, <laughs> keep track of them. Now, if you look at, put all this together, let's look at global electricity. Coal, big. Oil, stop coming down a little bit. Natural gas is going way up for electricity. Here's nuclear still rising, hydro rising, solar wind, and other. The recession, not much. We've seen a growth of nearly 300% in electricity demand globally since 1985. And the only two sectors growing faster than that are natural gas and the renewables. Renewables essentially didn't exist. So this rate is kind of hard or weird to calculate, but big growth in both those sectors. When you look at coal in North America and Europe, it's come way down. Where's it gone up in Asia? That's the Asian coal and there's the rest of the world's coal combined. So basically coal is an Asia story now, okay? Now I'm laying natural gas on top of the coal at the exact same scale. And you see a gas to coal ratio globally of 38%, transitioning to 62% and growing. And that's a good thing. Natural gas has a lot of advantages over coal environmentally. Sox, NOx, mercury, particulates, a lot of things. Methane and CO2 leaks have to be dealt with for climate to be sure. At 62% today, and natural gas on the right end is that's growing in all sectors, all geopolitical sectors, except Europe, which is sort of flat with its natural gas. So in order to get all that gas around, and it's a big LNG story, and you can see why the advantages of those who have natural gas and exporting it are starting to show. Now by source, again, we look at it here, here's electricity, and I'm gonna lay solar and wind on top of that. You will hear, you believe and know that solar and wind are growing faster than all other forms of electricity. That is true in terms of rate. And it's an important statement. It's completely factual, <laughs> but is it factually complete? Let's scale them the same. Remember they're right here in the data. So there's the solar and wind. And in 15 years, we've seen that kind of a growth compared to the whole electricity growth sector. In the same 15 years, the demand for electricity, the actual generation, 8,400 terawatt hours of growth in those 15 years and wind and solar account for about 25% of that growth. Everything else accounts for three quarters plus all the base that existed 15 years ago. That's the great challenge of scale. By country, China consumes more electricity than any country, the US is next and on down, 2012 and here's 2018 numbers. And again, China grew, India grew and passed Russia and Japan. Who's missing? Turns out it's the tech sector. Technology consumes more electricity than any nation on earth. Just look around, you know, you might be multitasking yourselves right now. Little kids are on them and my soccer game for my daughter who's in college now, we were all on our phones watching, pets are on them. I mean, tech sector electricity is phenomenal. Here's where we are today. And here's one forecast of where it could go. And this is, these are big numbers. In fact, all the solar and the wind in the world, solar and wind in the world, is about three quarters of the electricity that tech alone consumes. So when you read that technology is going to get all of its electricity from solar and wind, you need to read that carefully. It's talking about buying offsets of different kinds from places, and maybe it'll be solar and wind. If tech buys all of it, there's no more to go around to any other industrial sector or country or state, okay? So scale matters, it's, it's big and the tech Tech emits lots of CO2, use, use a tremendous amount of electricity to do exactly what we're doing right now. So big picture, global energy, same color scheme. The world, 60% coal and oil, okay? Still 60%, 3% solar and wind. Here's North America. We flattened in our demand and we're still growing economically. And it, we're about 49% coal and oil 
and 4% solar and wind in all of North America. Europe has flattened and is slightly coming down. So that's good efficiencies in Europe. And it's 50% coal and oil and 7% solar and wind. Russia, different things going on in the 80s and 90s, growing again, mostly natural gas. So you see some coal and oil, a lot of natural gas, and essentially no solar and wind. Pretty low latitude, haven't really developed it much yet. South America, demand continues to grow for all energy. It's been flat with some economic challenges. A lot of oil, very little coal in South America, 40%, 7%, 3% solar and wind. Africa growth continues strong. It's just getting started, okay? And you can see that it's got a lot of coal and oil, 64%, and a couple percent solar and wind. The Middle East is oil and gas. It won't surprise anyone. They've got one nuclear reactor now. They're starting to look at some solar, growing strongly still in demand. So only 47% oil, not really no coal, and a lot of natural gas. And then in Southeast Asia, look at the colors on the map. The map is a is a population map of the world. Every color is about 1.1 billion people, all the Western hemisphere. One, two, three, four billion people in Southeast Asia. And here's their energy demand growing tremendously. And 75% of it comes from coal and oil, half from coal, 3% solar and wind. So when I shrink and grow these to be proportional to demand, we see that half the world's population is getting half its energy from coal today and another quarter from oil. And that trend is not slowing, okay? Some of it is policy. This bump in coal was when China decided to go politically with coal. There was a little event here. <laughs> the Great Recession didn't have much effect. And there's some policy here with solar and wind globally as well and growing that wedge, but most of it is driven by resources. What will COVID-19 do? What will it look like? I'm just going to show one graph. This is, this is world oil production and consumption. World consumption tanked when COVID-19 hit in, the, in Q1, essentially March of 2020. We shut down the world's economy, which means we went from 100 and something barrel a day to 85, a big cut. And it started to grow right back. Now, production also fell, but it lagged. It took a long time to lay down the rigs, to realize it was going to be long lasting and to lay off over 100,000 people globally in the oil and gas sector. But look at the flip over here. Now what's happened? We have a crossover. We see consumption now rising and it's exceeding production. And when that happens, price goes up and you've seen price firming in the oil markets in the world. Pretty basic economics and some other politics as well, okay? But we are essentially almost right back to where we were, not quite yet, but pretty close back to where we were. COVID-19 is gonna change some work behaviors in developed nations like ours. We're rich. We can stay home and work if we have certain jobs in certain sectors, not in the service sectors though. But it's not gonna have a lasting impact on the global economy or the global energy mix because the infrastructure is the exact same coming out as going in. The infrastructure has not changed much, it takes a long time. I'm glad 2020 is going out. It reminds, I'm just glad, okay? We're starting to do things and interact again. The other thing that's growing is population. And here's the world's population forecast, UN mid-range forecast and where. And this is correlation causation. You can see we consume energy. The world could be wind, water, and solar if it was just for policy. US political leaders are saying this now, if it's just for policy, what would that look like and by when? So I modeled out to 2065, a 98% renewable world, 2065. So another 45 years from now, solar, wind, and more hydro, okay? Some are saying by 2040, how does that look? That is a big rapid change. What if it was 75% or maybe 50%, 50-50 by 2065 or 25% business as usual case. Here's that graph spread out with units on it. Now look at that, it, yeah, reasonable demand, actually quite low. And 25% solar, wind, and hydro by 2065. The exact same data, this exact same data as a percentage now, instead of in units, a mix, percentage mix. Look left to right. Coal and oil were 78% 
in 1965, 37% here. You double nuclear natural gas and you quadruple solar and wind. Okay, this isn't business as usual. The left side of that looks very different from the right side. And what you're seeing is a carbon to hydrocarbon to methane to uranium and thorium resource driven transition. A bump from coal policy and some policy here spread out to 2065 for solar and wind. It may go faster globally. This is global data. It may go slower, but it's not without challenge. Okay. These are dispatchable. That means I can burn them or create heat from nuclear or have rain, as long as there's rainfall, have dams. And these are intermittent. And this is the challenge of the mix that has to happen. So what are the impacts of all this? Well, it's, Aristotle said it's the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. I love that. You know, that's what we do at universities. We entertain thoughts. We don't have to accept them. I call it safe space. We can entertain any thought we want to and not be uh, derided for it. You know, it, we're going to be civil and we're going to talk and challenge. And that's what we need to do in the energy world for sure, because it is not binary. Really what he's talking about here is critical thinking, looking at the pros and the cons, all sides of an issue. So you're used to seeing coal pictures like this. This is Beijing and the air does look like this, except when they shut down coal plants for the Olympics and other major international events. You're used to seeing pump jacks and there is environmental impact from drilling for oil and pumping it out and moving it and refining it and burning it. And natural gas pipelines are a big discussion today. You know, they're, they're the safest way to move things, pipelines, safer than trucks, trains, and boats, that's for sure. But still, it's big infrastructure. And nuclear, we have all seen the cooling towers. That's steam, by the way. It's not CO2. It's steam coming off the, the towers. But there's other things, radioactive elements that come, or fission products that come out of nuclear. So we're used to seeing these things. In fact, coal oil and natural gas mining and manufacturing, land and water emissions impacts, drilling and completion on the land and water, the handling, the recycling and the disposal, moving it around, refining it and burning it. It has environmental impacts. Now it's getting better in wealthy nations, particularly where there's regulation. If you move this to well, nations that are just emerging, the regulations are much less, okay? Now, nonetheless, um, Sorry, I lost control of my, <laughs> I'll just say this, it worries us, right? And it's backed by popular demand. It worries us. We have, we worry about the environmental impacts of coal and oil and natural gas. And, and we, sh you know, we should, this is legitimate. This is the winner of the last photo taken contest, actually. I'm gonna show you the runner up in just a minute. Um, but let's look at the low density stuff. When you think of solar, what do you think of? I can guess what you think of. But it's probably not this. It's probably not a polysilicon plant. And there are a lot of these making solar panels now. And they're going to have to be a lot more. When you think of wind, what do you think of? It may not be this. These are wind turbine blades. They've been cut into thirds. And they're being disposed in landfill in Wyoming. There's only about 100 blades here, 300 thirds. And if, if we put wind guy to scale, these are gigantic things, OK? We don't recycle. We cut them up and we dispose them. That's 100 blades. Texas has 13,000 wind turbines, almost 40,000 wind turbine blades now. And a Tesla. We love him. We love Elon. He's an, he's an Austinite now. Here's a Tesla owner with their proud plate, no oil. They're probably, I guess they don't have tires or plastics in the car because that all takes oil. But they, when they think about their battery, they're probably not thinking about this. This is one of many large lithium mines in the world. And we mine it in lots of different ways. But these are big. These are big features. This is a lithium ion battery from a Tesla S. About three, see the penny, about three inches long, an inch in diameter. It turns out there are 7,000 of those in one car, in one Tesla S. 7,000 of those batteries bigger than your cell phone. To electrify the world's vehicle fleet would take 8 trillion of those. 1.2 billion times 7,000, greater than 8 trillion new batteries. That's a big number. We have tens of billions for all of our gadgets today. What does 8 trillion look like? Let's go to the football game at UT and cover the field with Tesla S batteries, no space, end to end, side to side. That's about 2.7 million. 
So I'm going to start stacking them an inch at a time. We got to get to 8 trillion, remember. We actually are going to leave the football field above Mount Everest and the stratosphere and into the mesosphere and leave that. We're going to go 50 miles into the atmosphere with a solid stack of batteries to electrify the vehicles in the world today. And then we got to make them again because they wear out in about 10 to 12, maybe 15 years if we're lucky. That's a big deal. That is a interesting challenge. So it's time to get serious about recycling. You bet it is, but the reality is we recycle less than 5% of lithium ion batteries today. It's cheaper to make them new. And where do, the, where do the minerals come from to make them? The lithium, China holds 60% of the lithium and 70% of the world's cobalt, starting to grow in nickel. That polysilicon to make the solar panels to charge them, more than half controlled by China now. And how about the cobalt? It's mined and the human rights violations are well-documented. You can read about them every single day, okay? So these electric vehicles are interesting. Here's one that has an electric license plate saying electrons and what's it charging with charging with diesel these are diesel generators making electricity you can't make that up burning diesel to charge an electric car here's the 7.2 million total electric vehicles in the world today and that's phenomenal the growth is still exponential it's 0.6 percent of the world's vehicles however even with exponential growth and i ask you those are the china china has a stated policy to be the leader in evs almost 40%. Are they clean? That's a critical thing. Where does China get its electricity? It matters, doesn't it? It charged with coal, 65, 70% of electricity in China is from coal. That's not CO2 low by any means, okay? So when we look at renewable energy, solar and wind, it has impacts too. You know, you gotta mine and process all the stuff to make the panels and the turbines and the batteries manufacture them in these big battery plants. 20 billion versus 8 trillion is a whole different scene. Produce on land for farms, move the electricity like we have in Texas, five major power corridors. And finally, where does it go? It goes into landfills. We don't recycle and reprocess much. So this worries people too. The sun and the wind are indeed renewable, but mining, manufacturing, and disposing are not, okay? Nothing is renewable in the energy world. You have to have something that collects energy, whether it's low density or high density, and it all comes from the earth. So it worries people too. You know, this is the, this is the runner up in the last photo taken contest. Uh, hey, look what I got, okay. So global energy by region. In North America and Europe, we see it flat. Here's the Asia Pacific and there's the rest of the world. That's energy consumption, okay? Here's CO2 emissions geopolitically as well. There's consumption and there's emissions, not much change. North America and Europe have been flat in our CO2 emissions and we are coming down. I guess we should pat ourselves on the back, but we can do better. Bad Asia, Asia emits more CO2 than the rest of the world combined now. Why? Why is Asia being so quote, bad? Well, this plot is, phenomenal and interesting. Below the line, the red line means you consume more than you, above it, I mean, you consume more than you produce. Below the line means you produce more than you consume, stuff. And here's the CO2 emissions globally. The United States makes 5 billion tons of anthropogenic or human CO2 emissions every year. And we consume more than we produce. China makes 10 billion, twice us, and they produce more than they consume. In fact, a lot of the non-OECD, the OECD is a club of rich nations, the non-OECD produce more than they consume and they make a lot of CO2 doing it. The wealthy nations consume more than we produce and we make some CO2 as well. But what's actually happening here? We have moved manufacturing the wealthy to those who want to manufacture. And trust me, China is thrilled and so is Vietnam, you see in our film switch on and a lot of Southeast Asia and other growing parts of Africa and Latin America to produce global stuff and send it to us on trains and boats and trucks. And what are we effectively doing? We're sending our CO2 back. We're saying, hey, producers, 
produce our stuff, send it to us, emit the CO2, and we'll be green. You know, this is kind of an odd zero emission strategy. Some states have it. Many companies have it. The ones who are announcing their zero emissions policies, read closely, they're buying offsets from who? Not enough solar and wind to go around. You've already seen the data. How many atmospheres are there in the world? There's just one, just one global atmosphere. And it's very efficient at moving emissions around. So this is not a very good global strategy, okay? You actually have to do some real things. It's not critical thinking, all right? This wasn't critical thinking either. Damn it, I'm supposed to put the boat in first, you know? So as we look at this, what can reduce CO2? Natural gas replacing coal has done it in the US. Uh, 700 million tons, carbon capture and utilization and storage. Big conversation now, finally happening. It's expensive. Nuclear can, both small modular and full scale. That's why China's building 50 of them. I hope India follows. Geothermal and hydrogen are starting to make a comeback, if you will. Hydro has always been here as long as you have topography and rainfall. Centralized wind is growing. Distributed solar for the billion people who have no energy. The only way to get it is out there on solar panels to begin. And finally, efficiency and conservation. Doing the same amount with less energy. These are the big wedges or the big levers, if you will, to reduce CO2. I don't have time to talk about each one, but I do want to show you the first one, natural gas replacing coal. This is a cross plot of coal emissions, CO2, against natural gas emissions. We're going to start with China going back to 1965, <clears throat> mostly coal. And this is a log log plot. So not linear, coal, 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 and then a little bit of natural gas creeping in, but it's almost a 12x coal to gas ratio in China today, 12x. The rest of Asia is a 3.2x. The United States is kind of weird. It's 0.6x today though. Okay, 0.6 instead of 12, about 1 25th. Now we had Jimmy Carter policy that pushed us toward coal during the first embargo in the 70s. And then fracking has brought us back. So we're back to where we would have been, kind of a coal to gas ratio and still decreasing that. What would happen if China went from a 12X to a 0.6X coal to gas ratio? Well, it turns out that would reduce nearly 2 billion tons of CO2 every year out of the atmosphere. 4.9 from coal going down, 3.0 gas going up, the net being 1.9. Okay, gas has CO2 as well, it's just less. And if the rest of Asia did that, it's almost another gigaton. The combined is nearly three gigatons of CO2 every year. That's the biggest wedge anybody is talking about. And then a lot less coal, but more gas would be required to do that. And if you could capture the emissions from that natural gas, you could double this. Or perhaps replace the coal with nuclear or some combination. But those are your dispatchable baseload options for the grid. Nonetheless, there's people that don't like gas. I took this picture outside the restaurants, keeping warm outside, heating the atmosphere directly. We just cut out the middleman. And right on the tank, this was an Aspen. It says no global warming because I don't know why. You know, I think we detach from what we're doing from what we wish would happen. So let's wrap it up. Critical thinking for equitable energy. I love this book by Hans Rosling, Factfulness. Data must, this is buried in the last chapter, in the middle of a paragraph. Data must be used to tell the truth, not to call the action, no matter how noble the intentions. And what he's saying is advocacy and activism are our right. But the minute you go down that road, you're kind of giving up your right to be objective because you're actively promoting something. Data must be used to tell the truth. This is a global energy image of the world at night electricity at night. It's a phenomenal global image. And we can see now, you've seen this before, here's the energy mix. It varies a lot around the world. And that's the proportional consumption. So you can see not just where the lights are on, but why they're on. And there are those that would have us eliminate coal, oil, natural gas, and even nuclear. Leave it in the ground. What's left? Would Russia do that, first of all? Or the Middle East, Africa, Asia? Southeast Asia, even the US and Western Europe, even if it should. Remember this link between energy, the economy, and the environment. You have to have healthy economies. 
if I cut the lights 90% on the world, what does that look like to you? To me, it looks like the past, not the future. Let's turn them back on and let's begin to think about what those lights do. What, look at where the lights are the most intense. That's where it's wealthy. Remember this map? I'm going to blend into it very slowly here. This map of wealth. Where the lights are on, it's blue. Where the lights are off, it's yellow and red. Cheap, reliable, clean. Hunger, clothing, shelter, clean water, the basics that come with a little bit of energy. Education and healthcare start to enter the mix as you have vaccines and refrigeration and lights in your schools and reading at home. Women who are disadvantaged by going for water and cooking indoors with wood and not getting to go to schools. Differentially disadvantaged in energy impoverished countries. Immigration and migration away from autocracies and autocrats who are controlling their countries and holding them strong with energy. Population growth is directly tied to education and that's directly tied to energy access. Our ability to invest in the environment requires wealth. And finally, to adapt and mitigate climate. You bring all these things together and that changes the world, okay? And I think that's what we're trying to do is change the world. So in our three E's, we have that radical middle. And to me, sometimes it feels like it's getting too small, a lot of fighting. But when you look around, maybe that's Europe and the US, but you look around the rest of the world, there's a lot of excitement going on as they begin to emerge and develop and grow and industrialize and grow that radical middle. To reduce the impacts of all forms of energy on the atmosphere, air, land, and water, to end energy poverty and build a global economy, cheap, reliable, clean energy. That's equitable and that's sustainable. Not simple, but solvable. It requires nonpartisan energy education and critical thinking. And I really appreciate your attention today. My day job is at the Bureau. We try to bring these three E's together. My night job is at Switch, <laughs> give my money and time to it, making films and trying to improve kind of our literacy of, of objective, critical thinking, nonpartisan energy education. So uh, John, I'll leave you with it and I appreciate everybody's attention and happy to address any questions we might have. Thanks, Scott. That was great. Uh, Nick and I are going to go through the, the Q&A and we'll start with some questions. Um, what I would start with is, uh, you know, this is always kind of funny, right? You're an energy expert, but you're not a lawyer. You're not an electrical engineer. And so if any of these questions are things that um, you don't feel particularly comfortable uh, answering, I would completely, <laughs> completely understand if you just said, I think I'll pass. Some of them are also hard to, ask or to answer because I don't want you to have to go back through your PowerPoint animations. So that makes it tough. But <laughs> no as, I'm, as I'm staring at the slides, there were a couple that were interesting. Um, one, if, if you take kind of switch is the given, when you think about the developing versus the developed world, um, what's going to drive consumption of energy? Do you think it's going to be innovation or do you think it's going to be policy? Like, are we going to force people to consume different kinds of energy or are we just going to have innovation that allows it to naturally evolve? Well, the, the consumption of energy is forced by demand. And demand is driven by economies, at least historically. We've been growing our population. Some economies have been growing, others are just starting. So energy demand continues to grow. There is a time when that population won't grow, the sooner the better. And then the growth metric is gonna be thrown on its ear and business school is gonna be really interesting. You know, <laughs> What happens when growth isn't the measure? That's down the road. But if you're asking what's gonna change the energy mix, I tried to show several examples of that. The energy mix globally is very slow to transition because it's a composite of all the different mixes. So you've seen transitions in the developing world now, the developed world, I mean, the US and Western Europe, away from coal to natural gas and some nuclear and more solar and wind. You're just starting to see some of that in the developing world that has some energy and some grid, but they're not really, they need reliable still. And you're not seeing that kind of transition in the emerging economies and early development where they just need energy, cheap coal and oil, the foundational energies for transportation and electricity. And we like it cheap too, by the way. I'm not saying we, we like it expensive. 
Europe pays a lot more for gasoline than we do. It's all in the tax base. And that tax covers a lot of other subsidies for some socialist economies, okay? Education, all sorts of other social programs over there. We don't tax gasoline as heavily. So we like it cheap too, but we have a very wealthy economy. So our regulatory systems, although not perfect, are so much better than most of the rest of the world. And again, I've been fortunate to see it in 65 countries and, and it's, it's very apparent, the lack of regulatory systems in place and particularly enforcement in economies that just can't afford it. So you have this composite, John, it's a composite of transitions that come together into some global. I tried to show you the electricity mix, which is a little different from the total energy mix. We had a couple of questions that were related to things you brought up. One is, um, where does energy policy get made? Like, it, is this more of a, at the national level, the state level, the regional level? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because that may be informative as well. Sure. I'll stick to the U.S. to begin and happy to step out from that if we want to. But in the U.S., it's all three. There's energy policy federally for sure. Um, some of it's well-intended and not very effective <laughs> to, to accomplish what it tried to do, and others is better. Um, I'll give you an example, like, let's talk about corn ethanol, right? This is, this is so-called energy policy. It's really ag policy for farmers, but it's, it's requiring ethanol to go in vehicles. It's been very effective to accomplish that, but what's it done for emissions and efficiency, debatable, and particularly cost? And I say that with a popcorn farm and corn farm, you know, so I'm kind of biased toward it, but I don't think it's that great. Um, so there's federal stuff, lots of different kinds. And boy, we're seeing it today, imposing things like potentially electric vehicles only, as if there is no environmental impact from batteries. We're not talking about that, but it's very real. And it's harder to envision it because they haven't scaled yet. It's easier to envision things that are here at scale because there they are. We can't see them as well, can't think about them until they go to scale. Other kinds of state policies matter for sure. Texas has some, California has its own. Governor Gavin out there is talking about no more oil production, electric vehicle mandates, cutting off natural gas hookups, et cetera. This is fascinating. We'll see what happens, but the loudest voices against that today are those that are the most in the lowest income sectors. Because when you drive up the cost of electricity, which those things do, or the cost of gasoline, which those do, it's called regressive. Everybody pays the same price for something. It means as a percentage of your income, it's more. That's what regressive means. So you're seeing a lot of outcries of regressive policies in states that have imposed heavy standards. And then they'll try to feed that back through a tax subsidies. And it, you know, so it gets pretty complicated. Uh, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. And then it's, and, and it's regional too. Um, there's places, there's places in Colorado that have tried at the county level to put moratorium on fracking, for example, and it's happened in Texas as well. So there's different things that go on municipal level and the city level, state level, federal level. And that happens globally. Although many countries have a lot stronger hold over their economies than we have with a federated set of 50 United States. Yeah, Dr. Tinker, we're getting some questions regarding uh, nuclear energy. Um, do you see the U.S. Um, ever seeing a meaningful increase in nuclear energy production? And then a kind of a follow-up to that is, uh, is, is, is there any difference between the way that France is disposing of their nuclear um, waste versus how the U.S. is doing? It? Yeah. Yeah, good questions. Um, so do I see it coming? I don't know. I can't. It could. We, we added a couple new reactors under Ernie Moniz when he was Secretary of Energy, first term Obama, brownfield. So we built new reactors kind of quietly where there were already reactors, okay? Took a long time, they're very expensive. But we think nuclear, there's really a couple components. There's, there's fission, which is what we do now. We split things to make heat, boil water, turn a turbine, run a generator. And then there's fusion. We slam things together to make heat. That fusion reaction is hard to constrain, so there's no current um, fusion energy, electricity, if you will. We haven't gotten there yet. On the fission side, there's the big reactors, the gigawatt scale things like we have and most countries have. 
And then there's the smaller reactors, small modular reactors, they call them. There's some country, companies that are quite fascinating. In fact, one's run by a UT guy named New Scale. It's a small modular reactor company. They've passed a lot of hurdles. 50 megawatt, 100 megawatt. You could put them in a small village for baseload and then put renewables there. So now you have the intermittent and the baseload in tandem. Okay, I could see these things coming. I connected John Hopkins, who runs New Scale, with Oman recently, the country of Oman, to think about nuclear. Why not generate electrons that way? The UAE is with one large reactor. So nuclear is dense. There are no emissions. You have to manage the waste. But read, uh, read Michael Schellenberger's new book, Apocalypse Never. He was Times Environmental Hero of the Year, worked in the Obama and Clinton administrations. He's a, a staunch environmentalist, but he's written a fascinating book, heavily referenced on how he sees climate impacts in energy now from where he has been. And he's a big proponent of nuclear. Bill Gates' new book that just came out, Nuclear. Okay, So you're starting to see some very thoughtful people, pretty staunch Democrats in that case, who are coming out for nuclear. And there's lots of reasons for that. Now, whether the US does it, we'll see. Uh, but the world's doing it. China's doing it. I hope India does it. You're starting to see some in the Middle East. And this is a good thing when you start, if you're really passionate about the climate particularly, but even other parts of the environment, you know, cooling towers, there's no sulfur, nitrogen, mercury, particulates from those emissions. The heat comes from a radioactive reaction and it's very dense. <laughs> now, it's not without challenges. Don't get mad at me because I'm, you know, we have to handle the, you asked about France. If you saw the first film switch, we visited the largest reprocessing nuclear waste or waste reprocessing facility in the world. They're called fission products. And they ship them there from all over Europe on trains and boats and trucks. We won't move them in the United States. Today, they sit in dry cask and swimming pools at all of our 90 reactors that are still going. They move them to this reprocessing facility and they essentially vitrify the waste, I mean, sil silicify it, put it with silicon and they put it in canisters in the earth in 30 foot thick cement and now some geological repositories that they've permitted but haven't started putting them in there yet. Shale, turns out. And then the remaining, there's like 1% left of the really radioactive plutonium and, and other highly radioactive elements that are, they're not weapons grade, but they could go, they're a step closer. So you have to handle those and manage those very well in that process. Now these small modular reactors, they do a much better job of that. They're inherently safe. They use their own waste again. So they're getting a smaller volume, lower heat intensity. You still got to deal with it, but much lower than old technology. So I'm not a nuclear guy. I'm not invested in anything with nuclear, but I'm a proponent of it. I think it needs to be a piece of that mix for the climate and everything else. So um, it's funny that you mentioned Bill Gates's book because one of our questions mentioned Bill Gates's book. And so as a, <clears throat> a lead in for this, I will brag on the BEG a little bit. I, I don't know if people at home know this, but the BEG has hundreds of researchers, right? So they don't have like a, a teaching presence on campus, but they are really out on the forefront of doing research. And one of the areas where they have excelled and is, is, is coming back into the, uh, into the forefront of conversation is in carbon capture, and sequestration. And so two kind of related questions. Can you talk about um, the future of that technology, but then related in Bill Gates's book, he claims, I think, that there, we're pretty close to technology that will do direct carbon capture. So can you comment kind of on carbon broadly defined? Sure. Sure. I showed, I showed one of the things just to basically a coal to gas replacement, which reduces emissions, but doesn't capture the emissions. We have, and thanks, John, we do some teaching, <laughs> a few classes a year. We have about 50 students at the Bureau that we advise, but mostly full-time research. Um, we've had a CCUS team for over 20 years. I put it in place in, I think, 2001. When I became director in 2000. So we got it going. Sue Havorka started that, leads it, Tip Meckel and others. We have been leading the nation's experiments of actual CO2 supercritical phase, which is kind of a weird liquid phase into the earth on many of the big injections in the country. Continue to do that. It's expensive. 
you know, it, it, to capture the emissions and then move them, uh, compress them into that phase and move them and put them in the earth and then monitor them and verify they stay there. That all costs money. So there's a cost to this. But, but now, because of the challenge of the reality that coal and oil and natural gas are a part of the world for a long time, particularly in emerging and developing economies, we've got to get it out of those emission streams. And it needs to go at scale. So when I showed those graphs with 36 gigatons, 36 billion tons from energy alone, that's a lot. That's about as much stuff as the whole oil and gas industry moves when it produces stuff. So it's an industry equivalent scale to that. In Texas, we've got legislative action going now that started in 2009, that's how long it takes. And, and I think it's going to pass to actually allow the Texas offshore. We own 10 miles of offshore in Texas. All other states own three. We were a sovereign nation when we became part of the union. So we kept 10 and, and that 10 miles is a lot. There's a huge storage capacity and it's not in the ocean. It goes into wells under, in the rocks under the ocean and goes into the salt water that's held in all those little pores. All the world's rocks, the little teeny pores, they're not big, the little pores are filled with salt water, old oceans, okay? So you put CO2 into that salt water and it carbonates it like your soda pop, about the same 1% mix or so. And it stays there for a very long time unless you shake it or break it, cut it open somehow or shake it up, change the phase. But otherwise it's stored or sequestered. And we're looking to do that at large scale in Texas. So we could take a lot of our emissions that Texas emits a lot. We make a lot of stuff for the rest of the world. We make more than our fair share. Texas is a net, we're one of those producers on a state scale, okay? So we could take our emissions, move them offshore, power plants, petrochemicals, refineries, cement factories, hydrogen factories, think of everything on the shoreline and put it under the earth offshore. We store more than our fair share. And those people who are making the commitments to go zero, neutral, zero carbon or neutral, they're buying the offsets. If they're gonna do it legitimately, they gotta buy offsets. They can buy them from Texas. Texas will sell carbon, real carbon disposal coming out to other countries or states or companies. And that's a big deal, okay? So that's kind of a long description of how that works, but a lot of moving parts, but it's starting to happen. Now, direct air capture is a different technology. It's Oxy is leading some of this. It's where you literally, you don't capture it out of the emissions stack. You literally scrub it out of the atmosphere. It's already there. And you begin to capture molecules of CO2 and put them back in the earth. You do this, in simplest terms by moving huge pore volumes of air through fans and scrubbing out the CO2. So you got to move a lot of air to get a little CO2 because when you think about the atmospheric right now it's 420 parts per million and that's up from 280. So 420 parts per million that's not much. <laughs> in percentage terms that's a really low percent so you got to move a lot of air to get some of it out but Oxy's starting to do this and others are too as a way to lower the actual atmospheric concentrations of CO2. Okay, hope that helps. Hey, Dr. Tinker, we're almost at about time here, but uh, could you spare some time for potentially one more question? Sure, I'm happy to babble away as long as you want me. <laughs> <laughs> Great, so there's a question regarding, um, there's a lot of focus with regards to oil and gas on electricity and transportation. Um, but less so necessarily on the fact that oil and gas are uh, feedstocks for plastics and other consumer goods, uh, which we often kind of overlook that. Um, do you have any perspectives you could share uh, about how our plastics consumptions may be affected by the transition off of oil and gas? Um, you know, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting question. I don't know that they're completely related that way. Oil, again, is is a hydrocarbon, a lot of carbon and some hydrogen. Natural gas is mostly hydrogen, CH4, methane anyway, propane, butane, pentane, mostly hydrogen, okay? Now that is used to make a lot of products, particularly natural gas, feedstock for a lot of different molecular products. And we use them in everything. Plastics is one, we use it in everything. All our fertilizers, makeup, it's in everything. 
it's a molecule that is very useful for the kinds of things we, we do. Oil in some things too, not as much molecularly, but some as a feedstock. So yes, if we quit burning oils, as we transition away from burning oil, it could be used for those feedstocks and not combusted. And that's a good thing. I think it's gonna be a lot longer before hydrogen, natural gas is transitioned away from there because again, it's ramping up in every sector globally today. And there's a lot of good reasons that that's happening mostly because it's a hydrogen fuel. So I think we got to separate the thought of oil from gas. You know, they're very different things. Um, potatoes aren't beef steaks. <laughs> they're food, but they're really different. And they have different compositions and way they get there and all sorts of things like that. So uh, now transitioning to a, an electric vehicle fleet is interesting. We talk about combustion engines and then EVs, but the one, the other leg of that stool that used to be more popular in the US, it's still happening globally, are fuel cells. Fuel cells are, use hydrogen to conduct electricity or carry electricity and run a motor. So you're running a motor like an electric car, but you're using, instead of a battery, a chemical battery, which you have to make and recharge and dispose, mine, manufactured, dump, you're using a different feedstock, hydrogen, that can come from splitting a water molecule or a natural gas molecule, methane. So fuel cells have a huge upside to them in terms of emissions from the tailpipe, but also from perhaps uh, more environmentally friendly feedstocks and less landfill dumping. Okay, so I, I, I wanna just keep that in the conversation because quietly a lot of auto manufacturers are talking fuel cells again. They got to talk EVs because that's what sells their stock. It's very popular. But again, intentions and outcomes. Remember, we got to be factually complete. And so the vehicle world has three big drivers, really fuel cells, electric batteries, and combustion engines. And combustion engines still have a role to play. And they are playing that role globally. They can be a lot more efficient than they are, for example, et cetera. So. Well, thank you, Scott. Uh, the, the last thing I was going to ask you to comment on, and I know we keep pulling it out, is you talked about NIMBY, and I'm more worried about bananas. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone, right? I, do you think we'll ever build any infrastructure in the United States again, whether it's clean, renewable, or oil and gas oriented? You know, John, it's, it, I don't know, um, but I know what will happen if we don't, okay? And I, I showed some slides on this. We are essentially going to seed, seed, seed our manufacturing to Asia and then the mining resources that Asia now controls globally. China is still building coal plants, even not in China. So if we don't build things here again, we're kind of doing one of these things and saying, we're clean, you build it. And again, in regulatory regimes that are not nearly as strict as ours. So if you're, if you're a true environmentalist, that's got to bother you. If you care about the global environment, it's land, it's water, it's air, and it's atmosphere. That has to bother you. I would rather build things where we can control and make sure we're doing them correctly but we have to build. If we don't, we're just importing the stuff that somebody else is making. And it's having a differentially large impact on a per unit product basis from what we're doing, okay? And that's not a good plan. That's a, that is kind of a completely fact or fact, completely factual sort of, but certainly not factually complete when you, when you really look at the global impact of stuff. Now, we gotta pick and choose got to do it well. I'm a big fan of if you're going to move molecules, pipelines are better than boats and trucks and trains. Those have humans and they have accidents. Pipelines do, but we know when. If we're going to move electrons, uh, we're going to have to move a hell of a lot of electrons if we're going to build low density solar and wind. Look at Texas grid, just scale that up. And, and the Biden administration is talking about hundreds of billions of dollars of power lines that have to be almost tripled in the country. Yeah, it took a long time to get that built in Texas. I mean, it was door to door and one power line never got approved. 
put those 345 kbs up it it's a big big challenge so we you know we've got to be really open about these conversations realistic conversations about what it takes to go to scale with anything and i tried to show a lot of examples of scale well, Scott, again, thank you very much for your time today. And I want to thank everybody for their questions. And I'd just like to point out a lot of the questions were interesting and they were really about costs. So like Cal School 4466 or the cost of orphan wells, recycling and things like that. And those are just hard to answer on the spot. So I didn't want to put you on the spot, like if you didn't have those cost numbers off the top of your head. But there have been lots of good studies that UT has done. You can check one out called the full cost of electricity that the Energy Institute did. There's some great sources out there. But Scott, it was great. We are gonna share a link to this where people can watch this again and we can hopefully use it in our classrooms and other places. So check that out on the KBH website. We wanna thank the audience for joining us today and give a special thanks to the Distinguished Lecture Series sponsor, Philip 66. We're very uh, thankful that you attended the last KBH Distinguished Lecture of the spring. And we are planning more live and virtual events this fall, emphasis on live. We're looking forward to getting back on the 40 acres for more information about the Energy Center, please visit the website and learn about how you can get involved. Scott, thanks again. Everybody have a great day. Thanks, John.